Hello, I'm Rebecca, the founder of Trio, and welcome to Pet Talks with Trio. Trio is the leading solution for workplaces to support their people during every life transition from starting a family to retiring and every life event in between. On Pet Talks with Trio, we chat to our expert partners for advice on how to best navigate these common, complex and often messy life stages that happen during our working career. Keep listening as we connect the dots between life and work with the simple aim of education and empowerment. After all, life happens at work. Today on Pep Talks with Trio, we're speaking with Sue Woodall, founder of Live Work Cancer, cancer survivor and advocate. We're going to be discussing the impact that cancer has on careers, lives and communities, recovery and some of the barriers that affect purposeful return to work. Sue, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Rebecca. Firstly, would you please tell us a little bit about yourself and the work that you do? Sure. Um, So I'm a cancer survivor, as we call it, and uh, I was diagnosed in uh, uh, 2020, right in the middle of COVID. Um, At that time, I was a a senior executive in the public service, um, and I reached that um, amazing role, um, having invested 40 years in, um, in my profession, Um, So cancer came as a real shock and um, it's been just over two and a half years since my diagnosis and, you know, as I started to, um, you know, come out of um, the the cancer fog, you know, I worked out, I was sort of working out, well, what am I going to do because um, I didn't have a job to go back to. Um, And I just thought, look, I'm sure I'm not the only one person that's uh, travelled this journey, uh, always been on this trek. Um, and that led me to set up uh, Live Work Cancer to really help the next person that has um, the difficult intersection of cancer diagnosis and and work. And um, and so yeah, so that's what I've set up, and it's uh, really started at the end of last year, and um, and uh, we've got a plan to. Uh, make it accessible to anyone in Australia Um, and uh, I'm doing my best to uh, assemble um, the services that are needed and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, shortly. What I must say you wouldn't know looking at you you wouldn't know that this is the experience that you've you're going through and you've still been through so before we dive into this discussion can we just set the scene um in terms of statistics how Mm. many people experience cancer in their lifetime what what Mm. what 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 let's can we put it into context yeah that's a that's a good place to start Rebecca um uh the first statistic is is around about a million or more than a million people living with cancer today in Australia um and um the cohort of people working with cancer is growing and there's really three main drivers for that one is that Um, we get diagnosed earlier. So that's good news um, because an earlier diagnosis means um, we've got a a better survival rate. Um, Secondly, um, we are living longer, which is also really good news. Um, That's what we want to do as we, you know, travel the challenging treatment and recovery journeys. Um, And then um, thirdly, uh, our population is expected to work longer. Um, when I first started work, the retirement age for women was 55. It's now 67. Wow. So that cohort's growing. Um, and the incidence of cancer in our population in Australia is exceeding the growth of our population. So our population growth over the 10 years to 2031 will be 15%. But over that same period, cancer incidence growth will be 22%. Wow. So, yeah. so actually we're almost getting thicker as the, pop- the, the, the population growth will be, it's shifting in terms of more sick versus yeah. in terms of how we're growing. Yeah, and the, the growth in, um, in uh, breast cancer is really yeah. outstanding. Um, and not in a good way. Um, the good news is that we are surviving. Um, but yeah, it's a growing it's a growing disease. It's actually cancer is defined as a disability. And I think that might be news to a lot of people on uh, listening to this podcast. 
Um, the number of uh, working age people um, between the age, let's say, of 20 and 60, I know that we, we work longer than that, but this is the available information, um, is that um, there's somewhere between 30 and 40% of that big cohort that are working and when they're diagnosed. And in breast cancer, it's actually 42%. Um, and breast cancer is the leading um, cancer for, for, for women. Um, and one of the statistics which only really uh, came to my attention in the last uh, two, three weeks was a study of about a 1,000 people in the UK. And um, that found that 71% of people that were diagnosed with cancer felt fearful telling their work, people in their workplace about their diagnosis. That's like huge. Yeah, massive. And why why was that? Because it's perceived to be career limiting. Mm, yeah. They were worried about losing their jobs. All of that and more. So um, the report says about 50% um, uh, were worried about the financial impact um, uh, or losing their job. And about 46% went back to work, continued to work during uh, their treatment because um, of the financial pressures, even though they were in poor health. So that financial pressure um, is a real um, pull to, for us to go back to work. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about, you know, um, well, actually I'll, I'll say that part of this research has, has uh, created a, um, uh, I would say, a huge pebble in a in a in a very big pond, uh, the UK and in in in, uh, in the US, to advocate for paid leave for a year mm -hmm. um, and job security for a year from cancer, um, because that's why we opt out or we are opting out because of um, you know. In, you know, we're not able to uh, establish a new working rhythm with our employer. Um, and the other thing that's really interesting is the same study that 87% of the people that did disclose um, their diagnosis uh, to their workplace, they found the right support from their, from their employer. So right. we need to make sure that in our workplaces, it's just part of um, our conversations uh, with our managers, with our peers, um, and our peers and our managers and our colleagues are um, well skilled at being able to have a conversation that's encouraging um, about cancer. And we are making progress in terms of mental health in that space. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure there's still uh, room for improvement and, and obviously parental leave. That's really just table stakes now in terms of ex expectations of the workplace. But in terms of cancer, you know, we haven't really started. Um, so that's really uh, one of the things that we need to take away and do something about, implement practical things. The last statistic I'll share with you is a report from uh, 2018, um, which estimated the cost of um, to our economy of uh, cancer is in the order of uh, $2 billion a year through lost labour. Wow, hugely significant. And yeah. we also know that losing attrition is hugely costly right now. So if there was policies or um, processes in place where people could be supported and held and retained through the journey or the recovery process, and then were able to return to work in whatever capacity suits both, there must be, I would imagine that that is actually far more cost effective than losing them because you're retaining your IP, you're retaining loyalty. And also the perspective of the employees within that organization and the narrative and the transparency around this life event is extremely positive. Mm -hmm. You know, what you're saying was that people didn't want to speak to their employer because of the fear and the mm. insecurity that, you know, 
or the lack of psychological safety and trust within that employer. But those that did had a positive response. Mm-hmm. So obviously organizations have a good intention when that happens, mm-hmm. but um, the cultural or psychological safety is somewhat mm-hmm. missing at that beginning or the trust with that employer is, is missing. Mm-hmm. So if they were able to retain their people through this journey, the outcomes financially and economically and from a talent perspective is actually hugely beneficial Mm -hmm. to the organization but also the employee that it's happening to and the rest of the team yeah well I mean work is I mean when you look at the wellness there's a wellness wheel that's around uh or wellness um uh yeah wheel is probably the best description I mean work or occupation and our financial uh um pieces of that uh, of that wellness wheel are, are absolutely critical mm-hmm. um, for so many of us, uh, so much of the population. So when cancer intersects with that, it yeah, it's really, really tough. And um, and you know, we focus a lot, in fact, yeah, we focus a lot as a community on returning to work and um, RTW plans, I really don't like the word return to work because we don't just work, their occupations, their careers, their pur- it's our purpose. Mm. So, um, yeah, I'm not going to use the return to work, um, although everyone understands what that means. I just think it's really limiting. So um, we want people to um, have enduring work participation, and that word enduring means that it's... Um, it's uh, long term. It's uh, it's it's our own little. It's our own purpose. It's our own mission mm. in life. Um, so yeah. So we've we've started talking already about that sort of um, impact on from an individual to their you know around that sort of team and work. What is the impact that you've seen on individual lives, their broader lives, and their communities? Can you share some insights with us? Yeah, so I think the first thing is that um, cancer isn't cancer. Or if you're my age uh, or thereabouts, you might remember an ad saying oils ain't oils. Um, and, you know, cancer is not a, you know, not a sentence anymore. It is just a word, but it is life-changing. And, um, you know, pretty much every day I have a moment where I think how – how did I get here? I mean, what am I? Why am I doing this? Um, unlike many people that I've um, been interacting with um, over the last, uh, well, since I, I had my diagnosis, um, I didn't grieve for my diagnosis. In fact, you know, I thought, well, you know, why am I special? Why wouldn't I get cancer? That was sort of really my my point. Um, whereas others. You know, depending, they may be younger. They may have. I mean, I don't have children, but I have, you know, um, children through my my uh, uh, through my spouse. But um, what really sent me into grief was the loss of control of. I'd say my work first, and then um, then subsequently, you know, my life experiences, um, and. I found it really emotional, um, less emotional talking to my my boss initially and HR, but when I actually addressed my team to let them know of my diagnosis, I've never been as emotional in a public forum as I was on that day. And, you know, um, it doesn't take much to rekindle that um, emotion. Um, but there's a sense of uh, confidence that you lose. There's a sense of uh, being burdensome. Like I really felt burdensome to my boss, uh, Phil. He was a, he's a great, great man, great leader. Um, but our relationship was really tested. Um, and when we, when uh, you know, we sort of got through my departure from work. Um, we rekindled that relationship and reconnected. And he's written his perspective of the journey, which is extraordinarily helpful for me mm. to understand not just my side of the story, but his side of the story. And I think he shouldered um, 
so much of uh, what it was to support me. He gave me time. He gave me the support I needed. But because I had a long uh, treatment journey and and the side effects had short and very long-term impacts, um, that relationship was really strained. And even relationships, friendships um, were strained because People get tired of, you know, they ask you, that, that firstly they say you look fantastic and you feel like anything but fantastic. <laughs> yeah. I won't use the expletive here. But um, and the same with work. As they, they, they're looking at you and they're saying, you know, they're trying to be encouraging, but actually it isn't encouraging. You start to feel like, oh, my gosh, you know, there goes Sue again. Um, she's just, you know, complaining and, you know, I've got great pain tolerance. I've got great re- resilience, uh, but I haven't never experienced what I experienced with uh, the treatment. And so um, the other thing around community and uh, my diagnosis, particularly with breast cancer, because breast cancer isn't one disease. It, and uh, you know, I want to. I said to my oncologist the other day, I want to call it something else. I want to call it breast cancer something something breast cancer, because my journey of breast cancer um, and the treatment that followed very different to people that I know that have also had breast cancer. So from a work perspective, if a colleague today was walked in and said, I've got breast cancer and you go through that journey with them, then the next person in a, a year's time comes and says, I've got breast cancer or their mother or their whatever, the bias that you have is that experience. Mm-hmm. And that actually is one of the key barriers to being able to help that person because you think that uh, somebody might have got estrogen receptor positive cancer, breast cancer. Um, They might have had uh, a um, a mastectomy. Uh, They could have had a reconstruction, Mm -hmm. uh, which is a massive operation for, for uh, for many, depending on the type of reconstruction that they have. Um, and they might be on a, an aromatose inhibitor or an estrogen blocker. For me, I had estrogen receptor positive, plus a protein was also growing the cancer, what they call HER2. And so my journey required lots of chemotherapy, you know, five, months of, uh, five months of chemo over six months, uh, radiation, and then uh, two drugs to to stop the production or to stop the impact of the HER2. So that went for two years in total. Um, and then um, and then I'm also on the aromatose inhibitor, the estrogen blocker. So that's for another five or seven years. I didn't get lymphedema, right, which is a swelling of an arm because they removed um, particular um, lymph nodes. Um, I didn't have reconstruction. I didn't have a mastectomy. So my journey is different. And so to think that the next person that comes into my workplace that has cancer with breast cancer isn't going to follow Sue's uh, experience. And so this awareness of what it is that a person is experiencing really should be shouldered on the employer. And I found that I was the font of all knowledge about my experience, which I which I am, but I was constantly educating and justifying myself to my friends, mm. not so much to my family, um, but because um, there hasn't been breast cancer in our family, um, uh, but also to my workplace. And I think that's what really stretched the relationship, that stretched the friendship that I had with a number of people in my workplace. Um, and um, I think the other really important point about this is cancer is becoming a little bit more invisible. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is, um, like, my hair's growing back. You wouldn't know I've, uh, I'm a cancer survivor. You wouldn't know that, you know, every year I go in and have treatment, uh, or sorry, every day I have treatment, and every year I have a series of tests to make sure that it hasn't come back. Mm-hmm. Somebody with metastatic breast cancer doesn't lose their hair on massive amounts of drugs in order to keep the um, cancer at bay. They can't cure it. And they may be on, I mean, metastatic breast cancer, you can be alive for five, seven, ten, you know, 
it's, you can have a full life. Yeah. Um, and so to not know and not be able to support the person with the invisible cancer symptoms, I think is a, is an issue for our workplaces. Um, so um, I don't know whether I've answered all of that question that you posed. Absolutely. To me. And what you know, whilst we're on workplaces, what do you think workplaces can do to be more supportive? Because it's a very tough conversation. Like you're saying, you either you know individuals may either have no experience or they have an experience of a cancer with one person which is completely unique to that person and therefore you don't really want them to carry that those perceptions into how they're going to you know deal Mm -hmm. or engage with the, the 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 new individual within the workplace and obviously this is becoming extremely prevalent so you know, we're not talking about one-off things that might happen during the duration of our career as a manager or something. It's going, it's becoming more prevalent. Um, and you like to say, we're working longer and it's, we're going to, as managers and as organizations and as colleagues, we're going to be experiencing this. So what would your advice be for organizations to support their people better mm. through what is, quite a common life experience yeah yeah look there's there's quite a lot um I'll keep it pretty high level um feel free to uh, tease out any point that you think might be helpful um I think firstly we have to create an environment where you can have the conversation um so uh diversity inclusion and equity is a good place to start we should be able to have these conversations with our colleagues in a safe space, um, whether they're a manager, a peer, a colleague, uh, whether they're, you know, three or four levels um, uh, more senior than us, we should be able to have that conversation. When somebody walks in the door and says, I've got a diagnosis, and they have, you know, been courageous in telling you that they have the diagnosis, and in fact, even told you what the diagnosis is, I've got breast cancer, it's not appropriate for the person to be asking, well, what sort or whatever, whatever, or maybe you don't even know to ask that question. So the second point I'd say is learn about the disease that you have now been um, privy to. Um, and it doesn't mean to say you then go into a series of questions, oh, is that, have you got this type or this type? Mm-hmm. But moreover, it, it starts to educate you around the complexities, not just of the diagnosis, but the potential treatment plans and the side effects of those treatment plans and the recovery process, mm-hmm. really important. So that, you know, when you're having the conversation with that person, you might say, you know, are you feeling, um, you know, the side effects, you know, does that include things like fatigue or, you know, um, gosh, are you going to have chemotherapy or, you know, what, you know, or even a more broader open question is what sort of treatment plan um, is your oncologist recommending? Um, because we're going to support you right across that journey. Um, and they may open up, they may not. Um, but it's it really um, important to have the conversation safely in the workplace and then to be able to be informed about the disease. Mm. Then it's really around less paperwork, less phone calls to say, oh, can you do this or whatever. Um, Trust your employee. If they come in and uh, they say that they've got cancer and they get a medical certificate, which won't say they've got cancer, um, trust them. I mean, yeah, there'll be... 0.0001% 0.0001% that might come in and say I've got cancer, but n- everyone is not going to pretend that they've got cancer. Why would they? So do you really need all these forms? Do you really need all this sort of clarification around when they're going to come back to work? Give them the freedom to decide. And when they do decide that they want to start the conversation about return to work, Make sure that their agenda, for me, needs to be is paramount because you might get them, you might sort of shame them or you might make them feel like they've got to get back to work because there's all these issues. But the fact is they'll go back too early because they're, you know, either financially they need to, 
um, they're missing their work colleagues, all sorts of reasons why they might be a attracted or pulled to go back to work. But then they go back at the wrong time, they go back too early, they try to do too much because expectations have been set. Then they'll burn out. Yeah. And then not only does that set back their, you know, financial um, uh, situation, their sense of uh, confidence, but you know what? It actually builds a big barrier between the employer and the employee. It's not good. It's not a good thing to burn out. Um, certainly um, uh, from, a, you know, a journey that wasn't part of your, you, you didn't decide. And I think also the aspect of returning to work um, is it's not a linear process. So you might feel, um, you know, you're ready to go back to work. Um, but if the expectation of the person that you're working with or the people you're working with is that once you're back, you're back mm. because everything's been fixed, I think that's the wrong premise. Um, women will have a, uh, with breast cancer, will potentially have a, um, uh, if they've had a mammogram, may go back in two years' time or a year's time for a reconstruction. Mm. And that's part of their cancer journey. And so it's a very much a variable. Um, a, yeah, it doesn't a, end when they return to work. It it's, does not end. It's actually the start. It's a new start for a new journey. And you don't know. Um I mean, I felt um, when I started to, about a year ago when I started to feel semi-human, um, I would, start, and COVID was sort of a little bit under control, I started to catch up for coffee with people, um, you know, just meet, you know, meet them. After an hour, I was exhausted, and then the afternoon I'd be in bed. Mm. Uh, now, I go there you know, all bubbly and really, you know, excited because oh, I'm seeing somebody, which is so important. But then I'm collapsing, um, and that's not visible to 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 people at work. It's not visible to your friends. Um, so yeah, it's a um, the workplace has a a big responsibility. I mean, one of the really p fantastic pieces of um, research I read and it was in their conclusion um, it was quite an extensive uh, piece of research and I'm just going to read it out to you because I think it explains the situation really articulately. Yeah. Interests of the employer and the employee in the cancer setting um, in relationship to return to work are interrelated. Now that's obvious right and it goes on to say but both have responsibility and both play a role, and I think this is the next bit is the really important thing. Both need support. Both are in need of support. So to, to assume that um, even if we didn't have an increasing cohort of people working with cancer, um, it's already been determined that the employee and the employer need help on this journey. And that's what Live, Work and Cancer is all about. It's about uh, not just helping the person who gets cancer, but also making sure that when they're going back into work, into that environment, when they're, um, when they're ready uh, to make that first step, that it's a good experience. Mm -hmm. um, and not only is it a good experience just to get back, they're still going to reach their career goals, their professional development goals that they had before they got diagnosed. Yeah, so your life doesn't end, and when you return, it's not the end. It also isn't the end of the process. Yes. It is really just the beginning. So, from your you're in recovery now. You have your business. What? What are the insights? What advice could you give somebody that is going through this journey? You mentioned, you know, going to meet somebody for coffee and that that human mm -hmm. connection piece. What advice could you give give people that are in a similar environment where they want to return to work? They're in recovery. Mm. What can they do? I think the first thing is to um, make sure that their return to work 
plan, which I really hate that word, but anyway, I'll have to think of something else, but return to work plan. Make sure that it's based on not their best day and not their worst day, but something really modest. That's the first thing. I think secondly, it's about um, having a conversation, an open conversation about your return to work or even putting it into your plan um, that talks about new expectations. And I made that really clear with uh, with Phil that although my hair was growing back, it's different colour. It's a, you know, I'm a different person. So the expectation of Sue running back up to work as though she never left, that's going to actually create a more damage, not just to Sue, but in terms of the whole group because my, I'm not going to meet their expectations. Um I think reaching out to others. Uh, what I've um, what I've learned uh, a, a lot about in the last, particularly six months, when I'm talking to uh, people with um, with cancer and all sorts of cancers, is that um, it's easy to get caught up in the vortex of somebody else's agenda, mm-hmm. but your health should be your core priority, and everything around that needs to fit. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's uh, it's not going to be helpful if you're going back into a space where stress um, and, um, you know, issues, um, uh, environment is not um, conducive to good health, good well-being. Um, and and have the conversation if you're finding that that, that is 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 the place. Um, what else would I say? Um, ask for things. Um, so when when you're diagnosed, the um, the people around you, the nurses, are great. They say, look, if somebody offers to make you a a dinner uh, and deliver a dinner to the door, accept. If somebody says, oh, I'll come in and clean your house, do that. Make sure that you continue to to use that. Um, uh, that you know, will be resourceful mm. in the workplace. So, um, and this may challenge some employers, but I think we need to, um, you know, we do need to set new expectations about cancer in the workplace. So apart from, you know, the usual number of days you work, hours you work, when I'm working from home, ask for more leave. Mm-hmm. No meetings or limited meetings. Um, ask for ask to be retrained to do your job because I'm well. My brain cells certainly were impacted by chemotherapy. Um, jigsaws and um, word all have helped to reconnect some of those sparks, um, but I'm still um, somewhat compromised um, cognitively. So um, yeah, uh, change the time expectation. So normally you, you would have been able to do that task or the expectation was that you'd be able to finish it in a week. So I need four weeks to do it or two weeks or, or whatever it is. Um, provide um, feedback to your employer regularly as to how you're going and adjust everything as you, as you, as you go along this very windy recovery you know, work career path, um, and uh, and reach out for professional help, um, yeah. both psychologically, physically. Um, you know, I'm a coach uh, now, and why am I a coach? I didn't do it to become a general coach. I really did it so I can have a really good conversation with people on the cancer uh, uh, trek mm-hmm. um, to be able to identify what they want, what their priorities are, what their goals are, and then do certain things so that they can reach those goals. Um, oh, the other thing that I think is really important, particularly right at the beginning, um, and and so that more people feel comfortable disclosing their diagnosis, take somebody along with you or have somebody else on the phone with you, you know, your spouse, a friend, you know, um, you don't need a doctor. All you want is moral support, someone to take the notes, someone to listen, someone to ask the other question that you forgot to ask that you were going to ask, someone that gives you a little bit of confidence and empowers you to, you know, Mm. 
be bold, you know, um, because if if we're silent, silence isn't going to create any opportunities for us. Um, and it's not going to help the employer either. Um, so openness um, is, I think, and, and, and as much transparency. I mean, Phil knew all of my side effects except two sort of taboo ones, which I decided, in fact, I haven't, didn't even talk to them, talk to my psychologist about one of, or one of them because, I don't know, it just was a bit sort of a bit yuck. Uh, but, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, what is the impact? Yeah, I can see how this openness within a work setting, although it can be, would be incredibly challenging and obviously many things are personal, but it really starts to change the narrative and perception of how organisations are supporting people through that entire work life cycle. Mm-hmm. Um, and even, you know, the things that you've said about, you know, offering to come and clean somebody's house or deliver a dinner, as a colleague, even just having those little tidbits of advice, it's like, well, that's manageable. You know, I, I'm not qualified to have a really challenging conversation or give you advice. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, I can come and drop you a dinner, you know, because now I understand the impact that this is having on you. And also around resetting expectations um, amongst teams, you know, yes, you might've done this in one week, now that expectation is different. You now have four weeks. So the, we're reframing expectations mm. at a team level means that we're going to be working far more cohesively as a team. You're not mm. going to be feeling that you're isolated and you're not delivering. The rest of the team aren't getting frustrated because you're not delivering the way that you were because we don't understand that actually the goalposts have changed. Um, so these conversations and being really transparent I can see how valuable and beneficial mm. that is mm. to everyone within an organization. Yeah. And then it breaks down those barriers when the next person, because there will be a next person because of the statistics that we're facing comes up, you know, and has an, has a, another diagnosis of, you know, a different, a different type of cancer. Um, yeah. It's, it's incredible. Now I want to touch on, you've mentioned sort of that you're coaching and that, that you mm. have a psychologist, which I could, you know, obviously there would be an, an enormous grieving process for anyone going through this journey. Um, you are, you have the coaching sessions that are available. Can you just talk us through the piece in terms of, you know, you're giving back, you know, it's, it's, mm. and I can see the value of having a coach that's gone through this journey is, is far more valuable than just a, a, a another coach that has mm. no real, real lived experience of what's happening. Mm-hmm. Um, but outside of that, um, you are hosting these mentoring community sessions. Could you talk through that, please? Yeah. So, um, yeah, so uh, coaching um, sessions, um, uh, they're free. For th- three sessions are th- uh, free. Um, and d- details are on my website. Um, also uh, have these network groups, which is small groups, about 10. Um, and then the other uh, part of it is information and network forum. So this is a bigger forum uh, or bigger sort of setting where employees and people living with cancer or colleagues can come and learn about, um, you know, how to be supportive through a cancer journey. Um, you know, what a, um, a an ideal transition back into the workplace might look like. Um, what does a career look like, um, uh, you know, not, not just after cancer because, Cancer sort of doesn't go away. It's 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 there. We might be in remission, or it might be sort of under control. Um, but you know what happens to our careers? Um, you know how do we have that uh, uh, challenging conversation? Because we don't really like talking about ourselves. How do we actually start that conversation with our with our, uh, our workplace? Um, and yeah, we've got the first one coming up in um, in May, and uh, that that's about a ninety minute session. My, a modest cost to cover, um, uh, to cover, you know, my costs, and um, and then it's about you know going in and helping workplaces or industry groups to set up, you know, not just policies but to implement um, bespoke 
um, cancer support inside the group, inside the organisation. And, um, you know, and that would entail things like, um, you know, having a ambassador mm. uh, or peer-to-peer support group. Um, you know, it could include, um, and this is really, I'd love to be able to report back in a um, few months' time that we've actually got an organisation that's pre-populated um, the list of all of the adjustments that they'll make for cancer. Yeah. So not just the time and, the, you know, uh, flexibility and but a whole heap. You know, there's probably about, you know, 15 plus um, uh, uh, adjustments or what they call accommodations that employers can make for, indiv- you know, for people with cancer. And that's not my, that's not coming from my experience. It's actually coming from the research that's um, a global research. Um, and I think if we can, rather than somebody saying, oh, can I have, you're actually saying this is your menu of all the adjustments we, we can make for you. And you may not want or you may not need that particular adjustment today. You might actually need it in a year's time. So you can sort of say, no, I don't need it now, but let's review it in three months. And that adjustment is automatic. So you've already set, you've already laid out the um, uh, the plan because you've thought about it. Um, and this is a thing for, for for us as cancer patients or cancer survivors, we don't know what we don't know. We don't know how we're going to respond to the treatment. Therefore, we don't really know what we're going to need from our workplace. Yeah. So that whole thing about return to work, you know, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a, Oh, yeah, as I say, I don't like it. Normally, yeah. well, it's it, it, it assumes that you get back. Yeah. It's, it's really trying to get you back into the workforce. But it's not about that. Um, and so those evolving uh, needs uh, can be part of a very open conversation right up front. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and we can look at it each month or we can look at it each you know, quarter or whatever or every six months to make sure that you've got what you need. Because who knows? It might come back as metastatic. You may have delayed lymphedema. You may have decided that you're not going to have breast reconstruction. And then all of a sudden, psychologically, you think, no, I've got to have a a reconstruction. And so that comes in in two years' time. Or you might, um, you know, they they might um, uh, put some new drugs on PBS um, so they're affordable. So you, you start taking a new drug in a year's time. Um, so the conversation doesn't start and stop. It actually is a continuum in itself. Yeah. Yeah. Sue, so I have learned so much um, from this conversation um, and it is incredibly personal. So thank you so much for sharing so openly. Um, incredibly sad statistics, um, but statistics all the same that we need to be aware of because... Mm it's affecting many, many people. They are in the workplace. And like you say, one of the biggest challenges is the financial repercussions. So if we can help organizations find humanistic ways to support their people better, then it's only gonna have better outcomes for absolutely everyone involved, including the organization. So thank you so much for sharing. It's been wonderful talking to you. Thanks, Rebecca. Really nice to spend um, some time together. Uh, this morning and uh, yeah uh, it it is a it's a big journey um, but it can be a better journey with some of the things that we've spoken about this morning so thank you thank you for the opportunity thank you for listening to find out more about how trio can support your people visit trio.com